of the casting uh, stage yet.
amazing in a movie or a television show, and they got in there and you're like, Jesus, I can't repeat. And the biggest hurdle in learning to be a voice actor is learning to read words on the page and not sound like you're reading. The thing is, by and large, you don't memorize. And it's different. When you memorize a speech, you can memorize how to say it and make it sound the way you want to. But most of the time in a voiceover uh, context, you're getting pages perhaps from the first time, certainly you can go ahead and read them, and you're reading them while they're recording. And we all know how we sound when we read. Like, oh, this is what you want to say. Having a good time, which you, there, there's something about reading that automatically flattens out what you're doing and how you're, how you're saying it. And you have to get that out of your system. And the, I've found, and I think most of the people that I work with found, the best way to do that is acting training. Figure out the way to take those words and make them speech rather than reading. Um, so yeah, that's, whenever I tell anybody what to do, how do you start a voice of acting? I say you learn to uh, But nowadays I also um, say, and I'll say this to anybody who's interested in uh, finding out about voice acting or there's a website that my friend Dee Bradley Baker, who's a phenomenal account of voice actor, put out called uh, I Want to Be a Voice Actor.com. And it's basically the answers he's given over the years to people every time they come up to him and said that. And he's put them all down on this web page. And it's, it's an invaluable resource to answer so many questions. What is your favorite character to voice act for, or one of uh, of your favorites? Um, it's impossible to say. Uh, I think I said this the other day. It was, uh, but if I were to record all of my roles like in one week, you know, at the same time, then maybe I could say, "Oh, Monday on Monday, I'm doing great. Monday on Monday is much better than you know doing." Uh, Chris mercenaries on Tuesday, but the thing is, they all came at different times in my life and with different experiences with different people, so it's impossible to actually compare them because every job is better or more favorite than anything else. Does it help when you're voice acting to like act out what the characters are doing? Like if they're frustrated, do you like make motions that you would make when you are frustrated, like rolling your eyes? Um it, it can help. It can help you performance-wise, but it can hurt you recording-wise. Oh, sorry, the question was, um, does it help to act out physically what you're trying to embody both? And sort of, the problem is, you can't move your head because your mouth has to stay in the same proximity to the microphone the whole time around. <laughs> because I'm, you know, they, you know they, the engineer is just going to go, cry. Ah. Why don't try it again? <laughs> um, and it's, it's actually been uh, not a problem, but a challenge. Because when I first started doing uh, games, I dreamed of a time Someday I can get good enough where I can do a punch sound without actually having to go, <clears throat> you know. And I dream that someday if I do this enough, I'll just be able to go, <clears throat> And the thing is, if you don't do some kind of indication, some kind of movement, you feel like you're not doing it right. It doesn't feel like it sounds right. You know? And then you get hit in the face. <clears throat> Is that different from getting kicked in the side? <laughs> Unless I move my body, I can't tell. <laughs> okay, that's getting kicked in the side. Um, so, but there are things that you can do and have to do. For instance, you can't sound like you're smiling unless you're smiling. 
And there's something, some weird thing about the human mouth that you can actually hear when someone's smiling. It sounds completely different. You hear the teeth, you hear the way the lips are, and it doesn't sound the same as when someone's not smiling. So sometimes if someone says, we need to sound a little more friendly, all you do is, you, you say the same line that you said before. You say the same line that you said before. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
the rings. But if they have prepared words, they have memorized words, they don't. Uh, but again, that's, that's not something I know what it's talking about. Um, is everybody enjoying the
subject of uh, unions in voice acting, uh, how, how is it different working for a company like Mi Bonichi Software that's not union? Like how, how does it affect like pay and, uh, and um, how does it affect, like I know you can't take credit for a non-union job, uh, how, how would it affect you if you were to take credit? Uh, well, I'm going to talk about very little bit. Because uh, I don't actually know. Um, I've never worked any non union jobs. Um, I've been in the screeners field since I was 16. So uh, I don't know. Um, what I have been told is the reason some union actors who work non union jobs will not take credit is because you can be punished by the union for working non union jobs. That's actually like Rule one of joining a union, you know, like Fight Club, rule one of Fight Club, I'm talking about Fight Club, rule one of the union, you don't do non union. Because it undermines the purpose of the union. You know, uh, it's like, all right, we've got this factory union, and everybody's going to get paid the same. And one man goes, I'll do it for half. You know, and well, why would we pay all these other guys twice as much? Let's just get a hold of him. Uh, so, you won't, you won't get credit because you could be penalized by the union. By the union. Uh, although, People are usually able to like pinpoint like who it is, though. Like, like if, if the word gets out, like it's so and so doing the voice for this character, can can they still get punished even though they weren't credited for it? Or 
The thing is, if the union had that much time and money, then they would they don't really need to worry about it because they would be around enforcing it against producers uh, rather than enforcing stuff against actors. Um, nobody has the manpower to go through shows and listen to voices and identify, you know, enemies of the state. They just don't. Um, it's, it's, it's much easier to just make things better. Because the thing is, if you work a non-union job, you get paid $200 one time for eight hours of work, and none of it will go to a pension plan. But if you work a union job, you get paid $800 for four hours of work, plus the producers have to contribute to money that you will get when you can no longer work. So, in the long term, it benefits us so much more to turn down a non union job and make that producer think, oh, I can't get anybody good unless I put in this money. And I mean, it's funny because video games used to be all non union. You know, I, mean, I remember we playing Resident Evil 2, and the voice acting was horrible. <laughs> you know, look, no, no, they're coming through! <laughs> um, <laughs> And it was, it was so bad that it actually hurt the game experience. And as the games got better and the visuals became more and more amazing, you couldn't have the guy in rendering come down and say, you got to be voice, come do this. It just didn't work anymore. You know, because you had the voices working against these amazing visuals. And that's when they started using union actors because they needed people who were better at this. You know? And they, they knew who they are. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone who's not in the union is not a great actor, you know. But percentage wise, uh, if you're a producer, you only have a certain amount of time. If you go to a bunch of people who are seasoned, you know, union actors, the odds are they're going to be able to get the job. More likely than if they have a bunch of guys on the street. I, uh, Um, I have no choice. I have no choice. Um, uh, John DiMaggio, uh, one of my uh, co-workers on uh, Futurama, is producing a documentary called "I Know That Voice" about the people in the voice of, in the industry of voiceover. Uh, and John is much much bigger than me, so we need to ask him to do that. What was the question? I have no idea. No, I'm actually very very excited. About there's also a podcast by a voice actor named Rob Paulson called Talking Tunes. And Rob is a uh, voice actor, he's one of the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, he was uh, Pinky in the Brain, uh, one of the Animaniacs. And he's just an enormously talented guy. And he sits down with people in the voiceover industry and just like chats. And it's always fascinating, you know. You learn how people make the voices they make, where they came from, you know, and it, it just blows my mind. Yes. Uh, what was your easiest and what was your hardest voice to prepare for? Easiest or hardest <laughs> voice to prepare for? Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, let's say easiest. Might have been, uh, say, this is a pretty easy place for me to go to. I think the pieces have a good time. Uh, all right, Jerry, let's go some better games. Uh, how this? Um, that was challenging, though. Maybe that might have been the hardest. Just, just keep it in this place. Yeah, the, the problem with the action sequences with them were the hardest because you had to make it act, active and threatening, but still so restrained and sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Most 
most memorable experience in your career? Uh, or, 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 I forgot. No. <laughs> It has nothing to do with the forum. Um, it has everything to do 
people who want it. You know, and I can't look at a game that already exists and say that the sequel will be just as good. Although, you know, sometimes like Metal Gear, it turns out that way.